Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to let you know the program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And uh, I want to thank James, uh, who became our latest Patreon uh, sponsor, at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. You can uh, become our pa- uh, Patreon supporter at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now we begin a five-week series of episodes featuring the great Mercedes McCambridge. Now, most of that is going to be in uh, defense attorney and the defense rest. But I decided to go ahead and start us out with uh, her uh, lead role on uh, an episode of Screen Director's Playhouse. So this is going to be an hour of uh, entertainment. Uh, Ms. McCambridge had a very uh, great career, uh, included two Academy Awards for Best Supporting Actress in 1949 on All the King's Men and 1954 on Giant. And she was well respected by her peers, including the great Orson Welles, who called her the world's greatest living radio actress. Which, given the fact that uh, Wells had worked with Agnes Moorhead, who was alive at the time, uh, that was very much high praise indeed. And she has such a unique voice and a very good um, acting uh, ability to really get into all of these characters that uh, she played. A screen director's playhouse was a uh, part of NBC's efforts to uh, rejuvenate its radio brand after Jack Benny had been taken by CBS and there had been so much uh, upheaval in many of the shows that were key in its lineup. And in many ways, this show was a lot like Lux Radio Theater or the Screen Guild Theater in adapting movies. Though some of uh, what Screen Directors Playhouse did was a little less recent than what you'd hear on Lux, where a lot of the films were just, you know, a year old. This film here um, was uh, released uh, in late 1945 and broadcast in 1951, and... uh, It's something to keep in mind because it does make sense of some parts of the story, particularly one where they reference uh, difficulty finding housing and hotels being uh, for rich people. Uh, It reflected the housing shortage immediately after uh, World War II, not so much a big uh, problem in early 1951. And we also get to do something here, or hear something here, that we have not uh, heard before in the uh, six and a half years we've been doing the great detectives of old time radio, is we get to hear the voice of Alfred Hitchcock. So now with uh, everything set up, from January the 25th of 1951, here is the uh, Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Spellbound. Screen Director's Playhouse stars Joseph Cotton, Mercedes McCambridge, production Spellbound, director Alfred Hitchcock. This is the Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Anison for the fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And now, our host narrator for tonight, the distinguished director of Spellbound, the master of suspense, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. (laughs) 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Alfred Hitchcock. The prime desire of any motion picture maker is to entertain his audience. But occasionally an idea is presented that can prove to be both entertaining and instructive. When we achieve such a wedding of qualities, we feel we really have something. And this was the case in the story you are about to hear. Spellbound was the first motion picture to deal with psychoanalysis, the method by which modern science treats the emotional problems of the sane. The analyst seeks only to induce the patient to talk about his hidden problems, to open the locked doors of his mind. Once the complexes that are disturbing the patient are uncovered and interpreted, the illness and confusion of the patient disappear and the devils of unreason are driven from the human soul. To portray the roles of Dr. Edwards and Dr. Constance Peterson, we are indeed fortunate to have Mr. Joseph Cotton and Miss Mercedes McCambridge. And now the first act of Spellbound, which begins in the office of Dr. Constance Peterson, a psychiatrist on the staff of Green Manors in Vermont. <laughs> Dr. Peterson, I've been watching your work for six months. It's brilliant, but lifeless. There's no intuition in it. Your lack of human and emotional experience is bad for you as a doctor and fatal for you as a woman. Dr. Fleureau, I've heard that argument from a number of amorous psychiatrists who all wanted to make a better doctor of me. Oh, yes, but I've got a much better argument. I'm terribly fond of you. Why? Well, for one, you're... Beautiful. If you please, I'd prefer it if you removed your arm from round my waist. Constance, you're not a textbook. You're a sweet, pulsing, adorable woman. Underneath. I sense it every time I come near you. You sense only your own desires and pulsations. I assure you, mine in no way resemble them. And now, Doctor, I'm very busy. If you'd care to, why don't you report your observations of me to our new chief of staff, Dr. Edwards? I understand we're to meet him at lunch. Twenty years of loyalty and tireless effort. It's hard to imagine Green Manners without you, Dr. Murchison. This institution could never have a finer chief of staff. Thank you, Constance. But the old must make way for the new. When are you leaving? In a few weeks. Oh, here we are. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, how do you do? Dr. Edwards, may I present Dr. Constance Peterson? How do you do? So to be seated. Thank you, Doctor. I've heard a great deal about you, Dr. Peterson. And naturally, I have about you. You're younger than I thought you would be. <laughs> My age hasn't caught up with me yet. I gather it won't. I've read your labyrinth of the guilt complex. It's an excellent work. I'm very grateful. Dr. Murchison has been kind enough to show me over the grounds. Green Manors is a remarkable institution. It must be quite beautiful in the summer. Yes, it offers various open-air diversions for our patients. Did Dr. Murchison show you the elm grove? Oh, yes. That's where we hope to have our new swimming pool. That is, with your permission. Well, you have it. I'm a great believer in swimming pools. Splendid. There's a perfect spot for it, among the elms. Not an oblong pool, but an irregular one. Uh, something like this. Look, I'll draw the outline with my fork. Stop it. What? I'm afraid I don't understand. Now, don't ever do that again. Well, all I did was draw these lines. Waiter, waiter, get, get this tablecloth off immediately and replace it with another right now. I'm sorry if I'd done anything. Uh, right. Hurry, hurry, waiter. Oh, yes, sir. If I'd known that. Uh, was... Well, forgive me. It's all right. Reminds me of my professor in psychiatry, Dr. Broloff. He could never stand a sauce bottle on the table or even a salt shaker. Odd, ah, this thing called human behavior. <laughs> Dr. Edwards, you sent me a note to come to your office immediately. Oh, yes, yes. I've been listening to Mr. Garms, and I thought you might help out. He's your patient. 
But Mr. Garm shouldn't have disturbed you. It's all right. I'm very interested in his case. Yes, I knew you would be. He fits perfectly into your chapters on the guilt complex. But I have no guilt complex. I know what I know. I killed my father no, and... No, no. you didn't kill your father. It's a misconception that has taken hold of you. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. You were talking to him. No, 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 no. Go on. Mr. Garms, people often feel guilty over something that they never did. It usually goes back to their childhood. And then they grow up with a guilt complex over a sin that was only a child's bad dream. What I'm thinking isn't true, then? No. And in the course of analyzing yourself, you will see that. Good day, Doctor. Okay. I think we'd better put him under drugs for a few days. He looks agitated. His conviction is curious. You've encountered such cases very often, Dr. Edwards. You describe them perfectly in your book. Yes, yes, I did. Would you mind doing me a favor? Not at all, Doctor. I have a headache. I'd like to take the afternoon off with you. Oh, but oh, I have... Please, some... please. I, I need a little fresh air, and you look as though it might do you a little bit of good. Come on, let's go. We'll look at some sane trees, normal grass, and clouds without complexes. I think the greatest harm done the human race has been done by the poets. Well, poets are dull boys, most of them, but not, not especially fiendish. They keep filling people's heads with delusions about love, oh. writing about it as if it were a symphony orchestra or a flight of angels. Which it isn't. Hmm? Come on, duck, duck under this fence. All right. No, of course it isn't. People fall in love, as they put it, because they respond to certain hair coloring or vocal tones or mannerisms that... Remind them of their parents. Mm, sometimes no reason at all. Oh, but that's not the point. The point is that people read about love as one thing, and they experience it as another. They expect kisses to be like lyrical poems, and embraces to be like Shakespearean dramas. And when they find out differently, then they get sick and have to be analyzed? Hmm? Yes, very often. Professor, you are suffering from mogo on the go-go. I beg your pardon. Now, don't mind me. I only say that to my best friends. Well, thank you, sir. Now, let's sit down here. This seems to be the most likely spot to relax and eat. Have a picnic here before? Yes, I've picnicked here. Alone. Well, that doesn't sound like very much fun. I haven't gone in for fun, as you call it. Hmm. Look at those mountains. Just look at them. Did you ever see anything so beautiful? It's perfect. Perfect. Constance? Oh, oh, it's you, Dr. Murchison. Thanks for giving my patient Mr. Garms a sedative this afternoon. I'm very sorry that I wasn't there. Nonsense. Just so long as you and Dr. Edwards had a good time. I see Dr. Edwards is a night owl, too. There's a light shining from under his door. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Yes? I saw your light, Dr. Edwards, and I... I... Oh, come in, come in. I didn't realize it was quite so late. What I was going to say was that I, I was going to read your new book. I'd like to discuss it with you. I never have discussed an author's work with him before. Of course, at school, we had several literary professors, but then that was quite different. I sound rather nervous, don't I? No, no, not at all. I thought I wanted to discuss your book with you. I'm amazed at the subterfuge. I don't want to discuss it at all. I understand. Quite remarkable to discover that one isn't what one thought one was. I mean, I've always been entirely aware of what was in my mind. And you're not now? Oh, this is quite ridiculous. It was stupid of me to come in here like a distracted child. You're very lovely. Well, please don't talk that way. You'll think I came in to hear that. <laughs> I know why you came in. Why? Because 
Something has happened to us. But it doesn't happen like that in one day. It happens in a moment sometimes. I felt it this afternoon. It was like, like lightning striking. It strikes rarely. I don't understand how it happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Darling, what is it? Why are you staring at me like that? Look, it's, it's not you. It's, it's something about your robe. My robe? I don't understand. Oh, forgive me. Something struck me. I've been having a rather bad time with my nerves lately. In your robe, I, 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 I mean the dark lines. Oh, but you're no, ill. No, I'll be all right. Hello? Yes, Dr. Edwards. Yes? What? Where is he? I'll be there right away. Mr. Garms has run amok. He tried to murder a nurse and then cut his own throat. He's in surgery. Pulse 140. How is he? How is he? His pulse is going down, Dr. Murchison. Step aside, Dr. Murchison. What's that? Why are the lights out in the corridor? What do you mean? It's dark. That's why Mr. Garms did it, because the lights are out. And put them on, and the doors and lock them. You can't keep people in cells. Dr. Edwards, Get you... away from me, you fools, babbling about guilt complexes. What do you know about them? He did it. He told me. He killed his father. Now put on the lights, quick. It's dark. Dark. Go. Grab him, Dr. Murchison. He's falling. Yes. He's in complete collapse. Thank you, Mr. There. Curious, Constance. Didn't look like a heart case. No. A shock of some sort. Probably brought on by... Oh, I wonder... When we ask you to try Anison for the relief of pain due to a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, we're not asking you to try a new or unproved method, for there are many people listening in now who have been introduced to Anison tablets by their own dentist or physician. You who have received Anison this way know the effective, incredibly fast relief these tablets bring. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. People by the thousands are using modern Anison today instead of other ways. Doesn't their experience seem worth following? Try Anison the next time you suffer pains from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. Ask your druggist for Anison today. Anison is spelled A N A. C I N. Now, the second act of the screen director's playhouse presentation of Spellbound, starring Joseph Cotton and Mercedes McCambridge. The answer to Constance's wonderment came to her as she sat at Dr. Edwards' bedside. The autograph signature of Dr. Edwards on the title page of his book did not match that of the note he had written to her earlier in the day, asking her to come to his office. Clearly the man before her was not Dr. Edwards. Who are you? What, what do you mean? You're not Dr. Edwards, I can prove it. There's no good denying it. Who are you? Yes, I... I remember now, Edwards is dead. I killed him and took his place. I'm, I'm someone else, I don't know who. I killed him, Edwards. Easy now. Mm. Lie back on your pillow. Oh, I... 
I have no memory. It's like looking into a mirror and seeing nothing but the mirror, yet the image is there. I know it. I know it's there. I exist. I'm there. How can a man lose his name, his memory, and everything he's ever known and still talk like this if, as if he were quite sane? Uh, you, are you afraid of me? No. You're ill. Loss of memory isn't a difficult problem. Yes, I know. Amnesia, a trick of the mind for remaining sane. You remain sane by forgetting something too, too horrible to remember. You put the horrible thing behind a closed door. We have to open the door. And I know what's behind the door. Murder. No, no, no. That's a delusion you've acquired out of your illness. Will you answer me truthfully? And will you trust me? I trust you. But it, it's no use. I can't think. I don't know who I am. I don't know. I don't know. When did you have your first doubt that you might not be Edwards? I don't remember. Oh, yes. Yes, when I was... When I was in the hotel room packing to come here, I found a cigarette case in my coat and frightened me. It had the initials J.B. on it. When I saw them in the hotel room, they made my headache. They're probably your initials. J.B. J.B. So now you must sleep. I think when you wake up, you'll be able to tell me more. Mm. I'll come in in the morning. Good night, now. And sleep. Good night. Constance, dearest, I cannot involve you in my troubles for many reasons, the most important being that I love you. When the police step in, tell them I am at the Empire State Hotel in New York. I prefer to wait alone for the end. Goodbye, J.B. <laughs> He's not in his room. He's escaped. Please, Sheriff, it's 5 a.m. You'll wake the patients. Sorry, Dr. Peterson. Seems to me somebody might have known what the real Edwards looked like. You never saw him, Dr. Murchison? No, I never met him. Well, it's my contention that he killed the real Dr. Edwards. There can be no question of it. He killed Dr. Edwards and then took his place in order to conceal his crime. Dr. Peterson, didn't he tell you anything about himself? You were with him for quite some time after his collapse in the operating room. No. He was unable to speak coherently. You don't seem very surprised to learn that this man was a fake and maybe guilty of murder. I thought his collapse was due to mental strain. That's a funny diagnosis for a fellow who's supposed to have just come from a vacation. I made no medical diagnosis. I was shocked to see him collapse, and I didn't think beyond that. You have no idea where he might have gone? No. Well, I'd better get back to my office and spread the alarm. Constance, I found this letter under your bedroom door. Oh? I didn't call it to the attention of the sheriff. I thought perhaps it might be something personal. Yes, thank you, Dr. Murchison. Good night. Constance, dearest, I cannot involve you in my troubles for many reasons. The most important being that I love you. Operator, the airport, please. Constance, why are you here? Really? Signing your name John Brown on the register. Not much imagination for an alias. You shouldn't have come here to New York. You don't owe me anything. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to take care of you and cure you. And I'm going to stay with you until that happens. But you can't. You can't help hide a criminal. I won't let you be stupid about it. I couldn't bear it away from you. I had to come. And I'll rent a room on this floor. And I'm here as your doctor only. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with love. Oh, darling. Darling. 
nothing at all. Try remembering. Let your mind go back to your childhood. Was it happy? Whom did you know in your childhood? I'm haunted, but I can't see by what it's no use. You lived somewhere. You had a mother. You were loved. You had friends. I can't remember anything except that I love you. If we can unlock one tiny memory, it will give us the key to all the others. No, no. The only thing that comes to the mind that, that, that I keep thinking of over and over is the logic of the situation. What logic? That it was I who was with Edwards. Look what it says in the paper. No trace of Dr. Edwards has been found since he left the Cumberland Resort in the company of his supposed patient. Do you remember that? No. Then why do you believe that you were with him? Because wherever we went, I came back with his identity. I wouldn't have come back as Dr. Edwards if I hadn't known he was dead, and how would I have known that, that he was dead if I hadn't been with him when he died? Were you? I don't remember, but... Logically, I know that I, I must have been, and logically, I also know why the body hasn't been found. Because it was, was hidden by me. But don't you see? You're imagining all of this. You call yourself names. You insist without proof that you're a murderer. Oh, you know what that is, don't you? Whoever you are, that's a guilt complex that speaks for you. It's a guilt fantasy that goes way back to your childhood. No. I think you're quite mad. You're, you're much crazier than I to do all this for a creature without a name, to run off with a, a pair of initials like that paper. Oh, I know. It's the bellhop. I ordered the later editions of the paper. Thank you. What's the matter? We have to leave here. Why? Story in the paper. Police hunt Dr. Constance Peterson believed aiding madman wanted in Edward's mystery. My picture's right below it. The room clerk will recognize it. We've got to go quickly. We can't back. Where? Where can we go? Rochester. Rochester, New York. By the way, why are we going to Rochester? We're going to visit Dr. Bruloff. Oh, oh, the fellow doesn't like sauce bottles. He was my analyst. He psychoanalyzed me. Really? Well, what, what was wrong with you? All analysts have to be psychoanalyzed by other analysts before they start practicing. Oh, that's to make sure they're not crazy. Apparently, the mind is never too ill to make jokes about psychoanalysis. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a pig. <laughs> no, I am, really. I keep forgetting you're a patient. So do I. When I hold you like this, I feel entirely well. Darling, will you love me just as much when I'm normal? Oh, I'll be insane about you. Oh, I am normal. You're alone here in this compartment. There's nothing wrong with me but a nice, long kiss wouldn't kill. Well, I've never treated a guilt complex like this before. No, look, let's stop and pick up where we left off. Pick up what? Try to recall the first moment you thought you were Edwards. Darling, I have a confession to make. I'm listening. As a doctor, you irritate me. I sit here swooning with love, and then suddenly you ask me a question, and I, I don't like you anymore. No, I mean, no. You have to sit there smiling at me like some smug know-it-all school teacher. I can't help smiling. That's what happens in analysis. As the doctor begins to uncover the truth in a patient, said patient develops a fine, hearty hatred of said doctor. Oh, you're going to hate me a great deal before we're through. And you're going to like that? As a scientist, Yes. Well, if I should happen to biff you one, you'll consider it a sort of diploma? Yes, but don't biff too high. <laughs> oh, darling. Darling, I love you. Come close to me. No, not, not really. I think we should go on with our investigation. No. We have some new facts to work oh, with. Oh, what now. facts? You're a doctor. You were in an accident. How do you know I was in an accident? Your arm and forearm are burned. And you were in Rome. I was never in Rome in my life. You were either there or going there because no. in a moment of stress you mentioned Rome. Now think of Rome. 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 Maybe Rome, Italy. When did you go to Rome? What did you do in Rome? Oh, think. I, I, think. The train, the railroad ties rushing by. I, think, think. Yes. I remember something. Fighter planes spotted us. You were flying. Transport medical corps over Rome headed north. What happened? They hit us. Caught 
caught fire, a uniform burned, bailed out. What uh, else? Oh, I, I, I don't know. It, it blacks out. You left the army. Yes, probably deserted. I hated it. I hated killing. I can remember that much. Your guilt fantasies were obviously inflamed by your no, duties as a soldier. stop it. Babbling like some phony King Solomon. You sit there full of half-witted double talk that makes no sense. If there's anything I hate, it's a smug woman. Please, darling. We're just beginning. Don't biff too hard yet. Our drama will continue in just a moment. But now, here's a word from RCA Victor. For you people who are buying television now, that word is combination. Yes, an RCA Victor combination, which brings you AM and FM radio, recorded music at all three speeds, and famous RCA Victor million-proof television. Now you can have all these in one beautiful cabinet for one beautiful price. Ask your RCA Victor dealer to introduce you to the kingly RCA Victor combination the Rutland. With its doors closed, the Rutland looks like a furniture masterpiece straight out of the 18th century. With its doors open, it is like an electronic masterpiece straight out of the 21st century. So superb are its RCA Victor features. AM and FM radio, two automatic record changers to play all record speeds, and exciting RCA Victor million-proof television, proved in well over a million American homes. Yet all these great instruments combined actually cost, cost you much less than the comparable console instruments would cost separately. Yes, with an RCA Victor Rutland, wonders never cease. But go on pouring out show after show, record after record, not just for one person, but for the whole family. <laughs> You are listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's All-Star Festival, brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Spellbound, starring Joseph Cotton and Mercedes McCambridge, will continue in just a moment, after a brief pause for station identification. This is the Screen Director's Playhouse. We continue with the third act of Spellbound, starring Joseph Cotton and Mercedes McCambridge, and guest narrator Alfred Hitchcock. Succeeding six hours on the train for Constance and J.B. or John Brown or whatever an amnesia victim can name himself was a series of questions and evasive answers. Relentlessly, Constance fought to reach the depths of his memory, but it was a losing battle. It was like a pygmy facing a giant, and J.B. was the giant. They reached the home of Dr. Brulov in Rochester. I worked with Dr. Bruloff as his assistant for almost a year, right here in this house. He got me the post of Green Manis. You like Alex? I doubt that one psychoanalyst in my hair is enough. What are you going to tell him? That we're on a honeymoon? Oh, doctor, you think of the most wonderful prescriptions. <laughs> Alex! Who is it, please? Oh! 
My old friend, come in, please. Alex, this is... One moment, please. There's company here. Lieutenant Detective Cooley. How do you do? The lieutenant is persecuting me. I just told him I know nothing about Dr. Edwards. But yesterday you had some theory. Constance. Steady, steady. I already have explained that if Edwards took along with him on vacation a paranoid patient, he was a bigger fool than I ever knew he was. It is the same as playing with a loaded gun. Good night now. It is late and my friends are here. Sorry to have bothered you, doctor. Good night, ma'am. Good night, sir. Good night. What do you suppose they're snooping around me for? The next thing, they'll give me a third degree. Alex, I'm so glad to see you. I was going to write you, but it all happened so suddenly. I got married. Who's married? Alex. My husband, John Brown. Well, I'm glad to meet you, officially. So you're married. <laughs> I congratulate you and wish you have babies and not phobias. <laughs> But the truth is, Alex, we have no hotel room. All the hotels were so crowded. What do you want with a hotel? That's for millionaires. You stay right here. Cook my coffee in the morning and the house is yours. Oh, how wonderful of you, Alex. <laughs> Your old room is upstairs. Good night and happy dreams, which we will analyze at breakfast. You know, this room has changed. Oh, but it isn't really. It's I whom changed. It's called transfer of effects. Oh, what is? The fact that everything seems so wonderful in this room. Oh, that's what it's called, is it? Darling, did the policeman disturb you? Oh, no, one ignores such trifles on a honeymoon. I, I take it this is your first honeymoon. Yes. I mean, it would be if it were. No, darling. Darling, for what it's worth, I can't remember ever having kissed any other woman before. I have nothing to remember of that nature either. <laughs> You're very sweet. Of course, I'm no child. Far from it. I'm well aware that we're all bundles of inhibitions. Dynamite dumps, darling. No, please don't. Well, don't do that. Why not? Well, it isn't ethical. I'm here as your doctor. Well, you may stop worrying, doctor. I'm going to sleep on the couch. Oh, no. No, the doctor occupies the couch, fully dressed. And the patient always sleeps in the bed. Now, I'll leave you for a bit so that you can get undressed and get under those covers. Covers? Covers? What is it? You remember something? No. This room reminds you no, of something. No, no. You're resisting the memory. What's in your don't mind? Don't start that again. Don't stand there with that wise acre look. I'm sick of your double you talk. You were looking at the bed. What frightens you no. there? It's white... Lines, yes. When I made fork marks on the tablecloth, they agitated you. And then that night that you kissed me, you pushed me away because of my robe. It was I... white. It had dark lines on it. I... Try to think. Why does the color white frighten white. you? Think of white. Yes. White. Yes, it, it frightens me. I can't look. Don't run away. Stand still no, no. and look at the white spread. I'll look at it and remember. No, 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 no. no. What is no. What is that in your hand? I don't know. I don't know. It's a straight-edged razor. Where did you get that? I don't know. I tell you, I must have picked it up somewhere. Give it to me. This razor. Why, why am I clutching this Where razor? Are you, Mr. Brown? You. I'm just having a glass of milk and some crackers. This razor. Join me, please. Well, I'll get another glass. I'm clutching this razor. When I was a young man, I was always saying if I could only get along by myself instead of. Oh, working stop that fool chatter. Go away, go away. Stop it. My head. My I'm head. Drink to you. You know and who I am. Know nothing except living. Here is your glass of milk. Milk? White. White. Kill. Kill. Are you all right? Good morning. Oh. Yes, 
I'm all right, thank you. Oh, I fell asleep in my chair. What time is it? It's seven o'clock, Alex. My husband is... is... He must have gone out very early this morning. You didn't happen to see. He didn't go out. He's asleep on the couch. And Constance, I know who he is. Yes, I should have known I couldn't fool you. This razor, I found it in his hand last night. He's a schizophrenia capable of committing murder. I'm going to call the police. No, Alex, please. Let me tell you about him. What is there for you to say, my dear? We both know that the mind of a woman in love is operating on the lowest level of the intellect. Yes, you're right. No, I'm not an analyst here. I'm not even a doctor, and I'm not going to talk to you as one. But believe me, Alex, not what I say, but what I feel. The mind isn't everything. The heart sees deeper sometimes. And the shock of a police investigation might ruin his chances for recovery. And, Alex, I can save him. But if he killed Dr. Edwards, how can you help him? But he didn't. He didn't. But if it turns out he did, which I am good and certain it will. But it won't, Alex. You yourself taught me what Freud says. A man cannot do anything in amnesia that his real character would not have done. And how do you know what his real character is? I know. I do know. I couldn't feel this way toward a man who was bad and committed murder. I couldn't feel this pain for someone who was evil. Ah, you are 20 times crazier than he. What do you want me to do? Give me time to treat him and cure him before the police find him. This could take a year. No, Alex, no. All right, a half a year. We should sit and hide for a half a year waiting to find out if he's going to cut your throat, my throat, and set the house afire? No, Alex, please. Just a few days. Before you turn him over, let me try for just a few days more. And if I can't do anything, if we both can't, then you can call the police. But you're not hiding a criminal. There's no evidence against him. Please. All right. Go make me coffee. I will pretend to myself I'm acting sensible for a few days. don't remember your father or mother? No. Wife or sweetheart? No. Don't fight me. I'm going to help you if I can. I'm going to be your father, Image. Trust me. Lean on me. All right, go on, go on. I'm leaning. Maybe you've got something you want to tell me. A single thought. A few words in the corner of your head. Go on. Talk to me. Whatever comes to your head, just say what it is. Nothing, there's nothing. I, I don't believe in dreams that Freud's stuff is a lot of hooey. I explain to you about dreams so you don't think it's a lot of hooey. The secrets of who you are and what made you run away from yourself, all these secrets are buried in your brain. But you don't want to look at them. The human being very often does not want to know the truth about himself. Because he thinks it will, it will make him sick. He, she, make himself sick at trying to forget. You follow me? I'm not interested. All I've heard around here is dreams, dreams, dreams. I'm sick of them. There's nothing in them. But there is. I tell you, I tell you what you're trying to hide. What they tell it to you in... I'll tell it to you in pieces of a puzzle that don't fit. The problem of the analyst is to examine this puzzle, put the pieces together in the right place, and the more cockeyed the details, the better for the scientific side. I, I, I can't make out just what sort of a place it was, but I was sitting and playing cards with a man. Yes, yes, it was a gambling house, but there weren't any walls, just a lot of curtains with eyes painted on them. A man was walking around with a large pair of scissors, cutting, cutting all the draperies in half. And then a girl came in with hardly anything on and started walking around the gambling room, kissing everybody. She came to my table first. Did you recognize this kissing book? Well, I, I'm afraid she looked a little like Constance. Oh, go on. Well, I, I was sitting there playing cards with a man who had a beard. I was dealing to him, and I turned up the seven of clubs. He said, that 
That makes 21 I win. But when he turned the cards, they were blank. And just then, the proprietor came in and accused him of cheating. The proprietor yelled, this is my place, and if I catch you cheating again, I'll fix you. Is that the end of the dream? No. No, then someone was leaning over the sloping roof of a high building. It was the man with the beard. I yelled to him to watch out. Then he went over slowly with his feet in the air. Then I saw the proprietor again, the man in the mask. He was hiding, hiding behind a tall chimney, and he had a small wheel in his hand. I saw him drop the wheel on the roof. And then, then I suddenly found myself in a weird, deserted desert. Constance was sitting there. I ran to her, but she disappeared. Then I heard something beating over my head. It was a great pair of wings. The wings chased me and almost caught up with me. And when I came to the bottom of the hill, I must have escaped. I, I don't remember anymore. So, something, something is happening. What is it? Oh, pull down the shades. The snow. The light frightened him. Not phobia. No, no, it was the snow. Look outside, look outside, Alex. What do you see? Well... There are two children pulling a sled in the snow. Exactly. The runners of sleds on snow. Dark lines on Please, pipes. please, pull down the shades. Are the sled marks on the snow the reason for the sudden disturbance? Answer me. I don't know. It has to be. It follows a pattern. First was the shock at the sight of fork lines drawn on a white tablecloth. Then my white robe. Please. It had dark lines. And a couple of nights ago, the white cover... Please, pull the blinds down, please. Dr. Edwards was fond of sports. He mentions tennis and skiing in his book. Yes, ski. Ski tracks in snow. That's what those dark lines symbolized for him. And his horror of them means, of course, that they are immediately connected with the cause of his amnesia. Yes, and murder on skis. Where did Edwards go for his skiing? We must find out. Can you tell us where? Try. He has told you already, in his dream. A sloping roof. That means only a mountainside. They were skiing. And the father image, the bearded man, is Dr. Edwards. It's very simple. Edwards plunged over a precipice while skiing. And then a shadow chases him up and down a hill. That could mean he was escaping from a valley. A valley? The skiing resorts are often called valleys, like Sun Valley. And he was being pursued by a winged figure, a witch or a harpy. No, the figure was you. If you grew wings, you would be an angel. But the dream was trying to tell him the name of the resort, an angel. Angel Valley. Do you remember Angel Valley? No, no, it wasn't Angel Valley. I, I remember it was a place called Gabriel Valley. <sighs> what else do you remember now? Who was the masked figure in your dream? It was an accident. Do you remember that? A skiing accident. Dr. Edwards went over a snow cliff. Oh, no, it was no accident. I, 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 I can't stand it anymore. I've, I've had enough of it. We've got to call the police. No. We've got to go to Gabriel Valley. You've got to go with me. All right. Get your skis on. We're going down that slope. I, I can't. Why not? I know about the razor and brew off. But nothing happened? And, well, let me give myself up. I've committed one murder, I can commit another. It's guilt. Guilt. You've lived with it for a long time, haven't you? Yes. Since childhood. What? Ever since your childhood, you tried to run away from something. You've always felt guilty about anything around you. What was it in your youth? It must have been terrible for you to prefer to think that you murdered Edwards. Rather than remember what happened long ago. I'm not going down that slope. No. You said you loved me. Look at me then. Why am I fighting for you? Because I love you. Because I need you. I'm nothing. Put your skis on. Right, but what good will that be? We're going down this slope as you did with Edwards. And you'll see your innocence. You'll see what really happened. You mean because it will happen again? Yes. What if I killed him? Isn't it true that if the episode is repeated, I'm likely to do the same thing I did before. How do you know I, I won't kill again? Because I'm convinced you didn't kill in the first place. Oh. Oh. 
Sometimes don't you believe in me enough to take such a chance? With your life? Of course I do. We're ready to go down the ski run. We're going to find out what happened to Dr. Edwards. I'm ready. Follow me. White, white with dark lines. I know about the razor in Brulo. I've committed one murder. White, white with dark lines. Ski tracks, Dr. Edwards' ski tracks ahead of me. I can't commit I've another. got to get close. I've got to be near you, Dr. Edwards. Isn't it true that if I kill Dr. Edwards here on the ski run, I'm likely to do it again? Closer. I've got to get closer. How do you know I won't kill again? Soon. Soon. Oh, no! Precipice ahead! Precipice ahead! Stop, Dr. Edwards! Fall! Constance, I remember Dr. Edwards went over the precipice. And where were you? I, I never was close to him. I know Edwards was at least 25 feet ahead of me as you were when he went over. Come on. Now we're going to the police. Oh, my darling. <laughs> Constance, I remember my name. It's John Ballantyne. I'm very pleased to meet you. <laughs> I ran into Dr. Edwards when I was in Cumberland Mountains trying to recover from some kind of nerve shock I got in an army plane crash. He was on vacation, but I asked him to help me and invited me to go skiing with him. We went through New York, and I vaguely remember going to lunch somewhere. I'm still a little vague about the lunch part. And then we arrived here, and the accident happened. Tell me. It's vital that you remember your youth. The incident... I, I believe I can tell you that. My, my brother Tom was five, and I was seven. We lived in a house which had a long banister alongside the steps outside. About the house and immediately below the banister was an iron spiked railing. Tom and I always used that banister for sliding. One day he went first, and I followed behind him. When he reached the bottom, he didn't get out of my path rapidly enough, and I couldn't stop. And Tom was impaled. And I realize now it was, it was an accident. I didn't kill my brother. And the ghost of the past is gone now, darling. Mm -hmm. That was the memory you were afraid of. That's why you took on the role of Dr. Edwards, to prove to yourself that he wasn't dead and therefore you hadn't killed him. It was your childhood guilt complex. Professor, I never quite realized in my amnesia state how very lovely you are. Hello, Dr. Peterson. Well, hello, Lieutenant Cooley. Did you find the body of Dr. Edwards? Yes, in almost the exact spot you told the mountain police it would be. Oh, thank goodness it's all cleared up. Well, not quite. I'm afraid a bullet was found in the body. That's impossible. I'm afraid, Mr. whatever your name is, that you're charged with murder. <laughs> Too bad, Constance, your Mr. Ballantyne was convicted of murder, but you have a great career ahead of you, if you forget. Thank you, Doctor. Well, Dr. Murchison, at least one good thing came out of all of this. You're back at Green Manors. Who knows what would have happened to the place under Dr. Edwards. I knew Edwards only slightly. I never really liked him, but he was a good man in a way, I suppose. Well, good night, Constance. I hope you feel rested in the morning. I knew Edwards only slightly. I knew Edwards. Knew Edwards. Knew. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Murchison, I want to talk to you. Please sit down. What's your problem? It's a dream that one of my patients reported. May I ask who the patient is? The patient is Mr. Valentine. Charming loyalty. What did he dream? He dreamed that he was in a gambling house. It was full of odd people playing with blank cards. Blank cards. Obviously, the patient was trying to deny it was a gambling house. One of the people in the place went around cutting drapes in half. Another was a scantily dressed girl who was kissing everybody. With a little effort, one could almost imagine them inmates of green manners. Yes, that's what I had in mind, Doctor. The patient was playing cards, now no longer blank, a game of 21 with a bearded man who was evidently Dr. Edwards. Yes, one usually dreams of one's analyst as authority with a beard. He dealt Dr. Edwards a seven of clubs, and Edwards said, that makes it 21. I would say that the patient was trying to mention a locale. The seven of clubs might mean a club. Yes, with the word 21 in it. There is such a place in New York. It's called the 21 Club. I've heard of it. And the patient dreamed that the proprietor of the place came in and began accusing Dr. Edwards of cheating. He ordered Edwards out of the place and said, I won't allow you to play here. This is my place. I'm going to fix you. The dream gives the locale a double identity, the 21 Club and Green Manors. But the proprietor seems to belong more to the latter. In fact, I would say that this angry proprietor who threatened Dr. Edwards was myself. It seemed that way to me. I presume you only arrived at this solution tonight and have confided your findings to nobody? Not yet. Was there any more to the dream? Yes. The patient dreamed that he and Dr. Edwards were on a high, sloping roof, and that he saw Dr. Edwards plunge over to his death. He also saw the angry proprietor hiding behind a chimney, holding a small wheel in his hand. He dropped the wheel. The symbolism of the wheel escapes me. It was a revolver. The proprietor who threatened Dr. Edwards' life dropped a revolver in the snow in Gabriel Valley after shooting Dr. Edwards in the back. The weapon is still there at the foot of the tree with the murderer's fingerprints on it. I cannot agree with this part of your interpretation for the good reason that the weapon is now in my hand. I imagined that something of this sort would happen after I made the slip about knowing Dr. Edwards. That started your agile young mind going. You were having a breakdown. And in a state of panic, you heard that Edwards was to take your place here. You sought him out in his favorite restaurant where he was lunching with John Valentine. You accused him of stealing your job. You threatened to kill him. He calmed you down and told you that he was off on a skiing vacation. And you followed him there and you shot him from behind a tree. That's enough. Did it ever occur to you that the punishment for two murders is the same as one? But you're not going to commit a second murder. I hadn't planned to. But you are here. You are not leaving. My gun is trained at your heart. A man of your intelligence does not commit a stupid murder, Doctor. You are thinking that you are not mentally responsible for that other crime in the snow. They will find extenuating circumstances in the state of your health. They will not execute you for the death of Dr. Edwards. You can still live, read, write, research, even if you are put away. I'm leaving, Dr. Murchison. Stay right where you are, or I'll shoot. I don't think so. You're thinking right now that if you shoot, it is cold, deliberate murder. You will be tried as a sane murderer, convicted as a sane man, and you will be killed in the electric chair for your crime. I'm going to telephone the police, Dr. Murchison. How does it feel to be a great analyst, darling? Not so bad. And a great detective. Wonderful. And madly adored. Very wonderful. White. You know, with a little orange blossom in your hair, you'll look wonderful in white. A long time ago, William Shakespeare wrote, 
The fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. How very wise he was. Our stars will return in just a moment with screen director Alfred Hitchcock. Next Thursday, the Screen Director's Playhouse will present Take a Letter, Darling. It will star two of your favorites, Rosalind Russell and Fred McMurray, with Screen Director Mitchell Lyson. Now, here again are our stars, Joseph Cotton and Mercedes McCambridge, and Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. Thank you, Joseph Cotton and Mercedes McCambridge, for a splendid performance. On our Screen Director's Playhouse, it is our aim to always present the best. And most certainly you both fall into that category. Thank you, Hitch, for those beautiful words. What else does an actor have to look forward to other than praise? Mind if I answer that, Joe? Surely, Mercedes. A paycheck. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously, though, it's been a great privilege to work with you, Mr. Hitchcock. And for Joe and myself, I'd like to say invite us back soon, won't you? Good night. Good night, Hitch. We'll be seeing you, Joe Cotton and Mercedes McCambridge. Good night, everybody. Spellbound is from the David O. Selznick motion picture production of the same name. Watch for the next Selznick release, Gypsy Blood, starring Jennifer Jones and produced in Technicolor. Joseph Cotton may soon be seen in Paramount's production, September Affair. Mercedes McCambridge may soon be seen in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's production, Inside Straight. Alfred Hitchcock has just completed Strangers on a Train for Warner Brothers. Tonight's cast included Herbert Butterfield, Bill Tracy, Jim Nusser, Howard McNear, and John Blyford. Dr. Samuel Hoffman interpreted the theremin music in tonight's musical score. Portions were transcribed. Tonight's production of Spellbound was adapted for radio by Jack Rubin. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley and directed by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen next Thursday when we present Rosalind Russell and Fred McMurray in Take a Letter, Darling, with screen director Mitchell Lyson. Listen again next week to Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Listen tomorrow evening to the one and only Duffy's Tavern, the Friday night feature of the All-Star Festival. This Saturday, Arturo Toscanini returns with the symphony on NBC. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surface series. Oh, and a madam's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Um, Obviously, this was a film that uh, took psychoanalysis very seriously. You could almost say that it was too seriously, but it definitely plays a big role um, in the uh, solution and the way the mystery is solved. Uh, The actual film ending was a bit darker uh, with the uh, killer actually committing uh, suicide and what was actually a very dark and uh, scary scene in the way that is uh, uh, portrayed. Overall, I I think that Mercedes McCambridge and... uh, and Joseph Cotton both did a fine job. They were definitely uh, the equals of the uh, original stars. And over radio, I think even excel that. Uh, Cotton, um, a 
an oft associate of Orson Welles as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first look at uh, Mercedes McKeambridge. We will be back with um, more next week when we get into the defense rest and defense attorney. In the meanwhile, I do send your comments to...